Well, this is a study that uh, we built with uh, several colleagues for, from uh, Europe and the United States when we realized that uh, at all our meetings when we uh, discuss about what are the important factors that determine the choice of adjuvant chemotherapy versus adjuvant endocrine therapy in patients that are HER2 negative, home receptor positive, there's a debate. There's a debate and we had this feeling that uh, in the world colleagues make choices in different ways. So we uh, devised a questionnaire in order to understand which are the factors that they believe are the most important ones in order to take a decision. Well, MAGIC confirmed that age remains a very important factor for the decision-making process. The way it was analyzed uh, shows that uh, whether you think of endocrine treatment or of chemotherapy, age comes out as a determinant. Uh, this is quite remarkable because I was hoping that we would see that the biological parameters are actually determinant ones because age, after all, uh, indicates that uh, in the younger patients, before the menopause, there's a higher percentage of patients whose tumor is not that endocrine sensitive. And in the older patients, we have more patients who have an endocrine responsive tumor. The problem is that age doesn't really define this. What is really defining whether the tumor is endocrine responsive or not is the biologics of the tumor. And what is quite interesting is that in MAGIC, we asked the uh, colleagues to look at different case scenarios. And uh, when you vary just one parameter in a case scenario, you see whether or not it influences our colleagues. And uh, while uh, certainly estrogen receptor positivity will shift the patient from the category that is endocrine responsive, i.e. if there's a high ER, to endocrine non-responsive, if ER is completely negative, but the questions here were about ER positive, slightly positive or very positive patients. When you put PR, progestin receptor there, then things remarkably change. And uh, in one case scenario, we had the patients, the patient that uh, had a low PR, and in that case, with all the other parameters, the colleagues were saying for 28% of the cases that uh, they uh, would, uh, sorry, I have to get this started because I got it reversed. So we, ha we had a uh, very interesting case scenario in which uh, we looked at how much PR would influence the decision-making process. When the patient had a low uh, ER percentage, uh, the patients uh, were going to be treated with uh, endocrine treatment in only 28% of the cases. And when the PR positivity was high, as decided by the clinician, because we didn't tell them what was supposed to be high, uh, then uh, suddenly this changed to 42%. But the evidence in the literature is that we actually don't know whether low PR or high PR really makes a huge difference in the endocrine sensitivity and whether that should really influence us in deciding for or against endocrine treatment when the ER is already highly positive. I think that we should revisit the data that is available out there in order to understand whether or not this is really something that we should take into account again when the ER is highly positive. It's completely different if the ER is, is low. Well, I think today we are still in an era of uh, believers and non-believers. In spite of the data that has accumulated in the literature, we understand that KI-67 is not that easy to measure. It has not been well standardized. There have been major efforts from key pathologists to standardize KI-67 measurement, but it is still not ex universally accepted, and in many countries it is not used at all. Uh, however, the St. Gallen consensus indicates that this is a factor that can be used to discriminate between those patients that are ER positive that might have some benefit from chemotherapy. These would have a high KI-67, whereas a low KI-67 indicate that endocrine treatment is probably the best treatment for these patients. The question is, what is low, what is high in KI-67? 
Many colleagues do use K67, many others don't use K67. Some use the surrogate, which is to look simply at tumor grade. And uh, many say that if grade is high, K67 has to be high. This is not always true. So there are lots of areas of uncertainty. And that's where then we ask our colleagues to say, well, if you are undecided, do you believe that something else than these classic parameters will be of help? And that's where we saw that quite a few would say yes. But then out of those that say yes, many say, well, I would like to, but I cannot use this tool because it's either not allowed in my country or not reimbursed and the patients can't afford it. Well, what we make out of that uh, huge heterogeneity in this intermediate group, because in the easy groups where you have all the determinants for endocrine responsiveness, the majority will use endocrine treatment, where you have really doubts that chemotherapy uh, is, uh, sorry, if you have really doubts that endocrine therapy is of any use for these patients, there is no big discussion, but there's a, an area of uncertainty. And that's where you see this heterogeneity. And that really tells us that we need better tools. And we do know that we have many tools available. Many are competing in the field. Some of them have been recognized by authorities like in the United States, the FDA, like the consensus meeting of St. Gallen. And this is uh, the Oncotype DX tool and others are still being discussed. But I think that the answer of whether or not these tools are really going to make a big difference is going to come from the studies that are ongoing and other studies that will be uh, shown to us in the next few years. Magic could uh, not come to a consensus. Magic is that's the picture of what people are doing. And we see that there's a huge variation among our colleagues in the settings of uncertainty and some will give chemotherapy others will not give chemotherapy exactly for the same patient and uh, i think the only consensus if we could call it is that we just need better tools and in some countries uh, some of these tools are now accepted uh, for reimbursement but they are certainly not ideal uh, we will need even better tools and we know that uh, the progress in pathology is remarkable and in the next few years we'll have even better tools than the ones we have available today. I think that we uh, have to realize that the uh, revolution of genomics uh, is already behind us. Uh, the costs of these tests have plummeted. And today to have a full genomic profile of a tumor costs basically nothing compared to what it used to cost. The question is, when we define the particular characteristics of a specific tumor, are these characteristics really indicating that this tumor will be better served by one drug or by another drug? And this needs to be carefully studied before we jump to conclusions which might be unfortunately wrong. I think that the answer is always the same and I'm sorry, put your patients into studies.